Can you all hear me? Is it loud enough? All right, people are nodding. Great. Uh, thank you all for, for coming uh, to, our, to our panel. Uh, this session will be about a career path in open source um, to kind of all angles of it, uh, including navigating a, a job that connects to open source, trying to get a job uh, that's in open source, or trying to hire someone uh, who will work on, on open source, because uh, none of this is very straightforward, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of experience yet. So uh, this is what we will cover today. We would also love to get audience uh, involvement. So please chime in with questions and thoughts. Um, I will try to remind you during the session as well. And uh, just a quick question to you before we dive in with everything. Is there anyone who's looking for a job right now in the room? A few people? All right, more than a few people. Um, is there anyone who's hiring in the room? <laughs> All right, then y'all should go and mingle after the session. Um, okay, let's dive in. So we will start with a little bit of introduction so you understand our journeys, and then we will dive into some of the details of those journeys. So my name is Ildiko Vancha. I have been active in open source for 11 plus years. Um, so I might not be entirely an expert yet, but I have decent experience now. Uh, I'm comfortable to say that. I work for the Open Infrastructure Foundation currently. It's a nonprofit uh, organization supporting open source software development communities. And I focus a lot on community management. Uh, I'm a community manager for two projects. So I do see a lot of the community side these days. Before the Open Infra Foundation, I was working for Ericsson, which is a large telecom vendor company. And I was working on open source within Ericsson, which was, let's say, an uphill battle. So I do have a good understanding <laughs> of the corporate side of, of open source as well. So uh, that's me, and I will. Okay. Um, is this on? Yeah. OK, now it's turned on. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nithya Ruff, and I run the open source office at Amazon, and my journey started in open source back in 1998, before a lot of you were born. <laughs> no. um, it was at a, a, a company called Silicon Graphics, how many of you remember SGI, mm -hmm. right? And um, SGI had always shipped proprietary products, but then you know, it was seeing the writing on the wall that people uh, wanted x86-based servers with either Linux or Microsoft Windows on it. And so they started shipping, you know, Windows, uh, Linux-based servers. And in those days, open source was always behind uh, proprietary Unix or other uh, systems. And so they, we had to fill the deficits. And so we started contributing and we worked on strategies around support. and. I, I got bitten by the open source bug. And so I've been working in open source ever since in various roles, mostly in companies. So I ran product management for embedded Linux at uh, Wind River Systems. And then I've run three OSPOs um, at SanDisk, Comcast, and now at Amazon. And I also sit on uh, the board of the Linux Foundation um, and some advisory boards for the University of California, Santa Cruz, as well as uh, RIT. So this is, this is my life. This is what I love doing and uh, helping companies navigate open source. Yeah, so I'm Dawn Foster. I got started in open source back in 1995 when I came out of university with a computer science degree. And I w started my career as a Unix system administrator for a manufacturing company. And turns out manufacturing companies hate to spend money on IT. So I used a lot of open source software. And at that point, I was really just, just a user of open source. And then a few years later, I ended up at, at Intel and they needed someone to look strategically across some open source developer tools in particular and Linux developer tools to decide which ones would be strategic enough moving forward for us to spend some time porting them to the Itanium processor, if anyone remembers that. 
Um, it's not still around. It was not not particularly successful. Um, but that's that's where I kind of got the open source bug, where I got um, you know part of strategically evaluating these these open source projects was looking at the community, and so I got really fascinated by how these communities of people came together and produced something that was you know really uh, fantastic software. So I got more and more interested in it, and then I sort of ended up doing it full time, and I ended up moving more on the community side. So I. I worked at Intel twice. I managed some open source communities. I worked for, I worked for some startups. I worked for Puppet Labs. I took a little detour where, for my midlife crisis, I quit my job and sold my house and car in Portland and moved to London to get a PhD where I studied the Linux kernel. So I spent a few years looking at how people work together and collaborate within the kernel. And um, and now I work at the Chaos Project, where I am Director of Data Science. So now I get to use all of this experience that I have working at various various companies to talk to lots of companies about how they can use data to improve the health of their open source projects. Allison Randall. I also started in the 90s uh, working on this whoops, obscure little project called Perl. I was one of the lead designers for the language, also Debian. Um, Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. So over the years, I've kind of split my time back and forth between corporate and community, uh, kind of balancing between the two. So like I funded my <coughs> Perl work while working as a Solaris system administrator at a university. Um, I also so funded some of my open source work by working as the, the manager for the OSCON conference, which was a big open source conference back in the day. Um, I also worked at Canonical. I was the technical architect of Ubuntu, and I worked at Hewlett Packard, uh, where I managed a team of OpenStack engineers. So, a mixture of different roles over the years. Uh, I also had a midlife crisis, went and did a PhD. I, I in intended to do mine on virtualization security, but ended up doing it on hardware security. Uh, so I'm now working for a research group in Cambridge uh, that's developing sort of experimental, more secure versions of RISC-V and ARM and do it porting Linux to run on that architecture. Thank you all. It, it kind of sounds like I need to think about what I'm going to do my PhD on soon <laughs> <laughs> when I'm having my midlife crisis. Um, but uh, since we're talking about some crises and, um, and everyone's journey, uh, let's dive first into kind of the, the day in the life um, aspect of, uh, of an open source career and the work-life balance, which can get sometimes hard to navigate. Um, so I will direct the question to Don first. Um, if like throughout your career journey and experience, like how hard was it or is it to, to balance uh, between uh, you know work hours and just doing something else outside of work when there's open source involved. And on top of that, if you've ever actually got to the point of burning out. Uh, yes, so that's a, it's a hard question. Um, I have got to the point of burning out. I burnt out twice. I burnt out at Intel and then again at Puppet when I went to, uh, what, that's where I quit and went to get my PhD. Um, but a lot of that, to be honest, the burnout, I think, was more travel and conference related, where I was doing all the travel and all the conferences, and so I was on the road. I was on the road a lot, and at uh, some of those companies, I didn't necessarily have a lot of support for management for, for what I was doing, so I think that the, the value the value wasn't really, wasn't really seen, which is, I think, more of what, what caused the burnout. But I, now, I am super protective of my personal time and it's something that it's something that's really hard to get to right when you work in open source because these communities just just never sleep right they're they're always on um, but what I what I sort of learned over time so I remember I went on I went on vacation once it was over Thanksgiving holiday and I I didn't look at my work email I didn't look at the community I just like shut everything off and then um, and then I came back after you know a week out and I was just kind of poking through the mailing list and I was like, whoa, this post has like 100 messages on it. What in the world happened here? Um, and turns out other people just solved it and I didn't really need to be involved. Um, so, so it just sort of solved itself before I got back. And had I, had I been sort of lightly working um, while I was on vacation, I would have inserted myself into this and it would have caused me all kinds of stress. 
So rather than that, I do, I am very protective of my, of my personal time. And so I really try to just not pay attention to things when it's, when it's my off, off hours. And so that's, that's kind of how, how I try to deal with it. next yep I, I think Don said some important things um, you need to have a manager who understands what you do and the value you bring and the value of your community work to the company or to your work right if they don't get that then they think it's a boondoggle or you're just you know running around traveling to all kinds of places um, it's also important I think to hopefully come back and communicate the value you got out of the conference and share what you learned and, and its context for the company. So more and more we are trying to write uh, trip reports at the company so that people, we can share our learning but also um, the uh, value that these uh, you know, relationships and communities bring to the company. Um, from a work-life balance perspective, I, I'm not a very good role model for that. Uh, I do work on Saturday mornings, and and I am been known to slack people, you know, all at uh, all times. And I don't always remember to say, "Hey, you don't have to reply back to this." And it's because uh, when it strikes me, when it occurs to me, I, I just do it. The hardest part, I think, of open source and corporate for me is remembering which hat you're wearing when and speaking from those two different hats or also trying not to have conflict of interest. I sit on the LF, we are members of the LF, so if there's a decision being made around the LF, I try to not be involved because I don't want to be biased about it. So I think those hats are the hard thing and, and the most important thing is your manager understanding the role of community in your work. Have either of you ever experienced that not because of obligation and the communities are always awake, but you're just so excited about what you're doing in open source because it's it's very often, at least in my experience, when you're when you're doing open source work, it's we're working on a common interest, a common goal. So we are just personally motivated and excited. Ha has it ever caused either of you a challenge in terms of still having a life? outside of I, that? I definitely went through a few years like that to the point of like losing relationships and stuff and I actually don't regret it because they weren't <laughs> great relationships <laughs> anyway but but I think you can only do that for a few years and I'd say it ebbs and flows like it's okay to be really passionate about something for mm -hmm. a few years and then realize okay now I need to take it a bit slower I'm currently in a phase where I take things a bit slower <laughs> and it's just okay like I get stuff done I do interesting work but I just like I do very much these years these days prioritize taking care of myself. So I don't know, maybe next year I'll hit another passion project and dive <laughs> in. But it, can, it can completely absorb you. And there were points in my life also where my only social life was open source conferences. All my friends were open source friends. And the only travel I did was open source travel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I never took vacations. And, and I said, oh, but you know, going to this conference is like a vacation, isn't it? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> because you are talking, you're it's exhausting, <laughs> especially if you think that you have to attend every single, you know, event and every single talk and meet everybody, and you just burn out. So you've got to, uh, like Don said, you've got to say, I need to take care of myself. What's most important that I get out of this event? And not to say yes to every single event, every single speaking opportunity, every single community opportunity that comes your way. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten really good at saying no to things. Um, I've also gotten good at uh, not feeling guilty about not doing things at conferences. If I wanna go back to the hotel room and take a nap for an hour, I'm gonna do that. If I wanna sneak out and not talk to anybody and have lunch all by myself, I will do that. And I will say no to lots of parties because I'm just not going to be up that late anymore. I and it does help with the conference exhaustion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, shared it, I shared that experience too. Like the, I personally battle with all the things of being introvert, having imposter syndrome, and name, name it all in the book. And at the beginning of at least my own 
career in open source where you get exposed to conferences and everything and you have to do social networking because that's the point of coming to the conference, hopefully for everyone, in the first place to meet other people. And that is investment of your time, energy, and just everything. And I feel that at the beginning, I felt a lot of that guilt. Like I was just so exhausted and I had to take a break, but like, what will I miss? I will not be able to meet this and that person. Um, I think that finding the balance with that one is hard. And at the beginning, I think it was, it was okay to put in that investment to start knowing people because once you have at least a small group of people who you know, then it's much easier to get to know more people. So like you put in the investment at the beginning and then when you start to build something up, saying that, okay, this is the time when I really will be now taking care of myself, letting the guilt go, um, that sort of worked out for me. But um, if I could go back, I would probably start to take care of myself a little sooner than when I actually did. But it is definitely a challenge, I think, a lot of us. Um, to move forward with, with the conversation, Nithya, you were mentioning the hack. So um, for, for those of you who may not use the terminology yet, we really often say that, oh, I have my community hat on, I have my corporate or company hat on, or I have both on. And that, and that goes both when you're participating in an open source community, uh, saying that, okay, currently I'm speaking as I'm representing my company and I'm talking about, you know, one of our use cases and that's totally okay. And then 10 minutes later, you're wearing your community hat and saying that, yes, we need to prioritize this for this project because this is very important and you need to be able to distinguish between the two. And this is also very true within the company as well when you're talking to your managers, you're talking to your teammates, maybe not everybody is contributing to, uh, to projects. So um, especially within the, the corporate environment, how hard it is in your experience to establish that there is a community hat and that hat needs to have time allocated to it. Is it, is it something that people usually need to fight for? Is it something that companies understand more and more now that that, that hat has to exist? And sometimes when the person goes and interacts with the community, they are wearing their community hat and then they are the individual in the community and in that context. I, th I think it varies depending upon the, the team in the company. I find that some teams are pretty sophisticated and when they hire a maintainer, they know that their responsibility is towards the open source project. Like we have a Postgres team and those folks do 100% Postgres work and people understand and respect that and value that and then there are teams where the developers have to fight for time to work on open source and their managers are always pulling them back into business crises or feature function. And they have to say, no, I have to do this so we don't build technical debt or to maintain trust in the community or upstream things. So it, it is hard. And also some people know how to know how to wear those two different hats in different places because the language is different in a company versus a community. When you're in the community, you want to make sure you're doing what's right for the community, not what's right for your company alone. Sometimes they align, but sometimes they don't, and so you have to kind of think about that. And when you're inside the company, you also need to think about the fact that companies are business drivers. They need to make money. Th that is the function of a company, is to sustain itself. So things have to make sense from a business perspective. You just don't do it because it's the right thing. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, in particular, when I was in more community-facing roles, the, the multiple hat thing was, was a real challenge because especially as the community manager for an open source project, on the one hand, you're representing the community um, internally within your company, but you're also representing your company um, within, the, within the community which uh, can, be, can be a challenge. And one of the things you have to learn to do is explain to the community why some things happen the way that they do and be able to explain to the company why some of the things that they might want to do are just not appropriate for that particular community. And so being able to have those very different conversations and those very different contexts 
I think is really important for, um, for being successful as someone who works in open source from within a company. This is something we talked about on the podcast recently. Um, so my background is anthropology and linguistics, and I tend to view this multiple hat thing from an anthropological perspective. It's like you're sitting in two cultures, and you're the culture broker between the two cultures. And the ideal is actually, it's not that the community hat and the company hat are in conflict, it's a harmony because the company is benefiting from the open source project and the community is benefiting from the company's participation in the open source project. But sometimes you kind of have to do this translation game to help them each understand each other and understand the value that each brings and understand uh, the way that they can benefit each other and benefit from each other. Um, so in, in my decades of work, it has more often ended up a harmony. That I've never really had it end up as a total conflict, like this wall of conflict. I have had it end up as a misunderstanding where one doesn't actually understand what the other needs or wants or why they are saying the things they're saying or doing the things they're doing. So a lot of times I can clear up those misunderstandings by using words that one or the other understands to explain the other one. And that really helps a lot. Is there any language, like if there's someone out there who's, uh, who's a contributor and struggling to, uh, to advocate for that, I need time for, for the community involvement, I need that community hat, is there a language that, or I mean, phrases or terms they could use with management to, to help with that argument? The, the word that, that I tend to use that is confusing to community members is investing mm -hmm. in the open source project that works really well with companies because they understand putting resources into a thing to get value out of it. So when you talk about either doing community work or code contributions as investing in that open source project so that you get value back out of it, I find that is a very helpful like angle on things that helps them kind of comprehend better what you're actually talking about. Yeah, and the other thing that I've learned to do is to Spend some time to understand deeply what your company cares about and strategically what your company is trying to accomplish and why open source is important to them. Because if you can talk about the open source work in a way that you show, hopefully with, with some data, she says with her chaos hat on, um, <laughs> and being able to show why the work that you're doing within these open source communities is something that benefits the company, then you're a lot more likely to be successful. Unfortunately, I, I hear a lot of open source folks describe the work that they do in the terms in terms that sound an awful lot like charity, which doesn't tend to resonate with executives at, at companies. And so if you can figure out how to explain it like, you know, like an investment or explain it in a way that makes sense for what you're trying to achieve as an organization, then it tends to be a lot more successful. Uh, well said. The only other thing I'll say is if the open source work is aligned with a dependency you have or uh, a project that's core to your company, it's easier sometimes to get that support. If it is uh, a hobby project or something completely different, it is hard for a company to justify um, making that investment. Most companies, I think, will support your open source work if it is aligned with business needs. Uh, outside of that, you have to find time to do it on your own, sadly. Okay, we have, I think, 15 minutes left, so I will throw one more question at you and then open up the floor to the audience. Uh, the next one that I have on the list is diversity and inclusion, so I, I wanted to throw that in because um, it is something that is a challenge in the tech industry overall and in open source, uh, in the open source ecosystem, it's even more when it comes to participation. So uh, what can we do better at both places? Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> all of the mics <laughs> coming to me. <laughs> um, what can we do better? I, I mean, it or starts more. Uh, more, exactly. I think what we're doing here is good uh, when you see people represented on stage, represented in talks and projects and leadership roles, then you believe that it's possible. And you see yourself there and you aspire to be there. And that's important. And, and I think the second is 
uh, which we've all kind of been part of and helped with, is making communities more welcoming, a code of conduct, um, you know, really responding to uh, new committers and new coders uh, in a positive, encouraging way. Um, and, and OSCON did this very well, and a lot of conferences do it very well, which is you've got to have a diverse um, chair for the conference, and you've got to have a diverse committee of uh, people who reach out and make sure that uh, the you know, conference speaking engagements and the events are inclusive. Um, and if you don't intentionally do it, it doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, and I think so within within the chaos project, we we strive to be extremely welcoming and extremely inclusive and really try to be a friendly place where everyone feels feels welcome and included and wants to participate. So it's something that's important to us as as just a project, uh, which is one of the reasons that I, I love the, the community and have been participating in it for as long as I have. Um, but the other thing that we do, we also do some um, DEI event badging, and we're starting to do some project badging as well. And the way I see this benefiting really everyone, like the whole ecosystem, the whole community, is that it gets events thinking about what they can do better. Because what we find is that people will start, you know, start looking, when you talk to people who fill out the form for the, in particular, the event badging, because we've been doing that for longer, what they do is they start to go through that form and they, they think, well, we don't really do that and we'd get a better badge if we did. Maybe I can add that before I finish going through the, uh, the form. And so it gets them thinking about what, what else they can do and how they can improve. And then we're hoping the project badging has kind of the same impact because what we're encouraging people to do is to create a DEI.MD file, just like you have a contributing file, like you have a security MD file. Um, that talks about all of the things that you do to within your community to make it more welcoming and inclusive. And so the hope is that it gets people thinking about what else they can do within their communities to make them better for everybody. Uh, there's one there's one topic that that um, that I've been talking to people about, uh, which is the uh, the use of term contributor very often gets. Uh, associated directly to code developer. Uh, do you all think that this challenge kind of also affects the, the DEI challenges of all? For sure. Oh, sorry. Um, I, you know, we in, in this community um, historically have valued technical contributions, specifically code, and all the metrics and systems are set up to count code submissions and leaderboards and you know celebrate maintainers, contributors, committers, but more and more over the last 10 years, I think we are hearing people talk about uh, all kinds of contributions that the community needs, uh, community management, uh, marketing, advocacy, um, legal, um, you know, all kinds of support and and that all of these contributions should be celebrated. And you often see diverse people uh, participate in the non-code area. So their contributions often got unsung, unrecorded, unrecognized. And I think by calling it contributor, it hopefully broadens it versus a coder or a, you know something. And hopefully the systems in chaos and other places are able to start counting other types of contributions and not just coding. Yeah, it's one of the things we've really deliberately done within the Chaos Project metrics is we try not to say developer unless it's a very specific code metric. We try to always talk about contributors. Um, and then we try to always mention that there are you know, lots of different types of, of contributions. And one of the things that if you look at a lot of the chaos metrics, they're not just, you know, grab a bunch of data from GitHub and do this, do this thing. Um, a lot of the, the metrics we expect people to gather via things like surveys, for example. Um, because if you're looking at DEI, it's, it's about, you know, how do, do people feel welcome within the community? What are you doing within the community that makes them feel included or not included? And so things like things like surveys and you know other ways of gathering data that are not just you know sucking things in from GitHub. Yeah, if you're 
interested in open source and aren't involved, keep in mind that open source is a community of human beings accomplishing a goal, and therefore every kind of role you can possibly imagine related to software, related to government, related to pretty much every human endeavor is necessary to actually make open source software successful. Um, so whatever skill set you have, you are valuable here. Don't ever doubt it. Before I ask follow-up questions, does anyone in the audience have questions to our panel? What are you curious about? What did you want to hear when you came into the room? Did you want to find, figure out how to get a new job? Did you want to figure out how to be better at what you do currently? Oh, there's one. Hi, thank you for this session, very useful. Um, real quick question about diversity. We see diversity a lot in the coasts, and I come from the Midwest in Cincinnati, and we don't see that much of diversity in all regions uh, of the country, of the world. What are you doing to kind of spread that message all across, you know, from end users to obviously software companies to be more diverse and get more activity from the wide area of the audience. Um, I, I think Don mentioned a few things. Uh, if you put it into the structures and the mechanisms of open source uh, ecosystems, you know, uh, how projects are set up, having code of conduct as, as a, a must have, having you know, diversity, MD uh, in, in projects, the project structure. Um, in, and you know, folks like LF and others are doing scholarships across the company, uh, country. Uh, you know, we have scholars from all over the world to come to conferences or to get involved in projects. And there's events like uh, uh, organizations like Outreachy doing scholarships uh, across the world. I, I don't think we have necessarily targeted the Midwest or pockets where diversity is not as clearly spoken about, but I'm thinking the intent is to raise the boat for across the world uh, by creating best practices and badging and uh, making it visible. So I, I don't know if uh, anyone else has anything else to say. Um, I work in community management, and um, basically I have a global community, and it's quite difficult to uh, organize within groups and meetings and make everyone feel heard. So with that challenge in mind, um, what do you do to make people feel heard that can join meetings or, you know, uh, time zone difference and that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a super hard question. I, I really I really wish we could easily solve that. I mean, it's something we we struggle with. So I um, so I work in the Chaos Project. I'm also a co-chair of a CNCF um, technical advisory group for contributors, um, and both of those groups are heavily um, organized around meetings, and the the time zones are are a big challenge. So I I sit in the UK, so a lot of my meetings are from six to seven p.m., which is not ideal, but it's better than uh, my friends in China where a lot of our meetings are at, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning uh, for them. And so it's, you know, we, we work and we live and work in these global communities where there's, you know, there's not a perfect solution for, for anybody. And, you know, one of the things that we, we really try to do is we really try to have, you know, the meetings are recorded so people can catch up with them later. We have minutes for the meetings and then we have other other channels you know asynchronous channels like like slack for example where people can can participate that way as well and then we we also the other thing that we've done that's been really successful within the chaos project is we have chapters in other locations so we have a chaos africa chapter for example that has been uh, really prolific, and they have brought so many new people with really amazing skills into the into the project. But by having that that hyper kind of regional focus, 
they they work on things that they care about. They you know participate in ways that that work for them. So having having chapters that have meetings in their local time zones can sometimes help as well. Hi, I just want to to maybe elaborate a bit more about tips and tricks around uh, conflict of interest because you said you don't find that that often, but I personally encounter a lot where you know like you have multiple companies that contribute to an open source project and they want to pull it in different directions or there is a commercial version and a commercial feature and some other companies in the same community want to push it in open source so there's a lot of these kind of like conflicts of interest and then that affects you as a community manager as well where like are you aligning yourself with the open source project and hence sort of like damaging your career as a company or are you aligning yourself with the company and hence uh, damaging your reputation in the community. Do you have some like tips and tricks around that? Yeah, so I'm, I would not say it doesn't happen, but what I would say is when it happens, it's because the company is being short-sighted. Uh, because if the company wants to get a benefit out of that open source project, they want that open source project to succeed. So if they are so focused on that one feature they're trying to push in or that one thing and not thinking about the fact that actually one of the great benefits of open source is that you bring a bunch of companies to the table and they share their use cases, they share their needs, they share their problems, and they work together to improve it. So like, it's not that it doesn't happen, it's that when it does happen, the way out is to help them to see the bigger picture. And sometimes it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of time and a lot of conversations, but don't just see that as, oh, that's the end, there's, no, no, but yeah. Like, do you have but some like tips for, make for, for that work? For how to, how to work through it? Um, a lot of it has to do with sort of network building, reputation building, uh, you know, being an active participant in those conversations in the company and not in an aggressive way, not in a career ending way, but actually in a way where you like listen to people and kind of help them work through the stages. It's, it's almost like therapy sometimes, open source therapy. You know, like help them work through the stages of coming to understand that actually it is in the best interests of the company for the open source project to thrive and serve their needs and serve the needs of other companies and serve the needs of the users. And like, it, it, I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but it is possible and it is worthwhile. And you know, I've, I've been through this at multiple companies kind of helping them shift through those paces of getting to a place of beneficial participation. From a community perspective, I'd say beneficial participation. From a company perspective, I'd say strategic investment. Um, but it's the same thing, actually. It is exactly the same thing, just different words. And I would say too, as the community manager, one of the one of the things that you can do is, you know, have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with some of these people that are maybe creating a lot of this conflict, and just because if you can have some one, I know I know we're supposed to do everything out in the open, but if you can have some quiet one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and better understand where they're coming from. Um, that takes the conflict away, right? Because they're not having this conversation in front of the people that they're having the conflict with. And so if you can better understand where each of them are coming from, then that helps you find ways to bridge those those gaps and, and help help these people, the, the people, the companies, help everybody reduce that conflict. Cool, thank you. And with that, we are just at the end of our session. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming and please catch us after the session. We are still here, so catch us here in person or offline, where whichever social media or other platform you can find us because we are all, I think, everywhere. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.